Long before the clatter of modern life was heard in Martin County, a different song arose from the shady hammocks and rain-soaked marshes. It was a medley of sounds from man and beast, the rifle-like crack of a cowboy's whip, the soft lowing of vast herds roaming freely across grass flats and boggy sloughs, the crackle of wilderness campfires as a lone harmonica pierced the dark. From the 1840s on, hundreds of courageous settlers forged a new life in these swamps and prairies, raising cattle and citrus to feed their families and fuel their dreams. This is their story of hardship and triumph. The wilderness that became Florida had sheltered the A's and other native tribes for centuries before Spanish explorers arrived in the 1500s. But these conquistadors brought two legacies that changed Florida forever, the long-horned Andalusian cattle and the tiny orange seed. The Spanish eventually abandoned this mysterious land, but their free-roaming cattle remained, and native Indians scattered orange seeds deep into the Florida peninsula. By 1817, Florida became known for the violent clashes between adventurous settlers and Seminole Indians who had migrated here in the 1700s. After the bloodshed of the Second Seminole War, Congress moved to encourage settlement by giving 160 acres of wilderness to any armed settler who could build a home, farm the land, and survive for five years. The new flow of settlers resulted in statehood three years later. In the 1890s, one of Western Martin County's first settlers arrived by ox cart. Francis Marion Platt, his wife Annie, and their four children traveled from Pine Level near Arcadia, bringing their cattle in search of open range. They lived alongside the Seminole Indians on high ground in western Martin County. Francis named his tiny one-house town Annie after his wife. It later became known as Indian Town. Like many early settlers, they raised both cattle and citrus. A bad year for one crop could be balanced by the other. Together they cleared the first road into Stewart, a twisting wagon trail, so that their children could attend school. Originally called the Stuart Annie Road, it laid the path for today's State Road 76. Isolated deep in the wilderness, where survival relied on ingenuity and back-breaking work, the Platts found the open space frontier families coveted. And these people, some of them still has the trait. They didn't want anybody living very close to him. If you was in five miles of his house, you were stepping on his toes, you better move further out. And they, they kept that going. His houses built all over Florida, and that was the reason they were built everywhere. Another Indian town pioneer in the late 1890s was Joe Bowers. Uncle Joe and his brother learned from the Seminole Indians to plant their citrus groves on the high knolls. They traded regularly with the tribe which had settled nearby in a patch of oaks that is now Indian Town Middle School. There is a little thicket of, of, uh, of oak, scrub oak trees there today, and the children now park their bicycles out there. But that's where the Indians settled. And uh, Joe Bowers dealt a lot and traded with them. He had a little trading house. Parts of the Bowers Grove still exist today, as does another pioneer home built there a decade later. In the early 1900s, the Platts built a home in Stewart, bringing their children closer to school. The family's two-story house, which also stands today, was a testament to the success these pioneers had achieved in the wilderness. Life in the Florida wilderness, whether raising cattle, citrus, or both, meant dealing with nature on her terms. Some of the obstacles and difficulties they had was lack of transportation, except by horseback or with an ox cart. Oh, the mosquitoes, the sand flies, and the horse flies. I guess the rattlesnake was one of the worst things, and then the high water 
everywhere they went, they had to swim their horses. Heavy rains and the hurricanes, there was no warning like there is today about a hurricane coming. You had to watch the weather and just kind of go by feel. Florida's weather, notorious for its abrupt changes, dealt a stinging surprise to unsuspecting citrus growers. A cold snap in late 1894 was followed with a catastrophic freeze in early 1895. The only warnings were the train whistles, frantically signaling the advancing Arctic air. During the 95 freeze of February, a story's been told that a grower could stand in his grove and the noise of the trees splitting would sound like rifle shots. It was said that some growers told at the dinner table of the impending damage rose from their seats and left the state. Overnight, the Florida citrus industry was essentially wiped out. The turn of the century brought enormous changes to the settlement now known as Indian Town. A large company, Southern States Land and Timber, bought Indian Town and two million surrounding acres. Sawmills sprang up along the lake's shore, transforming majestic pines into railroad ties. Many families were supported by the sawmills, but the native landscape was irrevocably ravaged. By 1910, Southeast Florida was being hailed around the globe as a land of plenty. Here it was said novice farmers could plant orange trees and harvest their fortune. Investors who bought a 10-acre plot in the newly created St. Lucie Inlet Farms also received a free town lot in Salerno. Prominent Palm Beach attorney Charles Chillingsworth used the same strategy to create Palm City two years later. His Palm Beach Land Company developed hundreds of 10-acre farms and sent traveling pitchmen to find buyers. Many families, lured by promises of a cornucopia of abundance, settled in Palm City. They struggled mightily to clear their land and plant groves. But early 20th century technology was no match for nature. Back when they planted those groves in, in those years, they planted, they, we didn't have the St. Lucie Canal, they weren't in existence at that time, and we don't have all the mo modern, didn't have all the modern conveniences that we have today. Florida's torrential downpours, periods of drought, and occasional frost proved overwhelming to the small family farmer. Many settlers put their last dime into the sandy soil, only to abandon their farm and return north with dreams and finances in ruins. In 1915, the United States Army began dredging an immense 25-mile-long drainage ditch from Lake Okeechobee to the St. Lucie River. The St. Lucie Canal was envisioned as a thriving water highway that would transform Stewart into a major port. This grandiose dream never materialized, but the Bessemer Company in Port Mayaka foresaw an equally promising use. Once water flowed through the monumental channel, it could be pumped onto thirsty groves along the route and offer precious relief for flooded pastures. It took eight arduous years to complete the canal, but when water first gushed through the mighty ditch, it signaled the dawn of a new era in agriculture. For the first time, man was the master of water, and Bessemer was able to harvest the potential. As the railroad carved its way through cypress bays, swamps, and hammocks, the Seaboard Airline Railway made Indian Town their southern division headquarters. But the railroad's president, a. Davies Warfield saw even more. He wanted to create a model city. As a crowning centerpiece, Warfield built the splendid Seminole Inn with its pecky cypress ceilings made from trees in the Alapata Flats. He died suddenly in 1927, and the Seaboard Company abandoned his plans. Up until the 1920s, fate had been far kinder to the cattle rancher than the citrus grower. Weathered, hard-working cowmen had turned wild scrub cattle into impressive herds that roamed freely across open range. Each spring, the roundup, or cow hunt as it was called, started anew. Cowmen rode hundreds of miles chasing cattle out of hammocks and swamps while fighting off hordes of mosquitoes with homemade skeeter brushes. 
Sometimes where they didn't burn the woods, the flies would get so bad that they would kill some of the cattle and uh, they, they would kill deer. Far out on the free range, cowmen would bed down under the stars. If it rained, they had to sit up in their saddles all night under a slicker. Food and shelter at the cow camp was limited to whatever they could find or carry from home. The way we had to sleep on the ground was we had to cut palmetto fans and stack them up and that would keep the underground moisture from coming up and wetting you from the bottom. We didn't have ice like, like we had then, we had salt meat down. And uh, you got used to eating a lot of salted meat. <laughs> you had to keep that. But we just cook over a fire and uh, we'd get up early in the morning, build a fire. And if, you, if you're lucky, you had a coffee pot. A lot of times what we had just a can and we'd hang our meat on a stick. But most of the time we didn't have no grill like they did this day and time. And you could just take a sharp cabbage, uh, old palmetto, saw what we called them, sharp this end off, stick it in your meat, and just stick the other end in the ground and stick it over fire. Cowboying was a rough and tumble job that required a level head, good cow sense, and the right tools, a horse, a whip, and a dog. Early settlers were able to make use of wild horses descended from those left by the Spanish. These were small, tough horses called cowponies or marsh tackies. But a hardy horse was not enough to chase stubborn cattle out of the swamps. Cow dogs were essential to controlling wild cattle that could stampede or scatter at a moment's notice. In the most of places, uh, the dog is a drive dog. Our dog is not that kind of dog. We can drive the cattle. We can't stop them. We got to have something to go up there to get ahead of them, stop them, because we can't outrun them to the cypress ponds and the boggy marshes and places. The dog has to go hold them up for you to drive it. Hmm. Yeah. Catch him. Get him. Yeah. Old Blue struck his trail. Yeah. Get Run that fox up a tree. Perhaps few cowboying tools capture the imagination as well as the whip. Made of woven hide, stretching 12 to 15 feet, it makes a rifle-like crack that could be heard for miles. Making the whips by hand was an art that George Junior Mills began at a young age. Many a cowman has carried his handcrafted whips as an invaluable tool and sometimes a signal. A lot of fellas would know if you pop that whip as much as three or four times, successfully one right behind the other, they'd say, that man needs some help. The cows is getting away from him or whatever, you know. They kind of, we learned to go by it as a kind of a signal like from one bunch of men to the other, you know. Raising cattle or citrus was not just a man's work. Women were the backbone of the ranch and farm, keeping dozens of details running smoothly. Well, I can say I did a little bit of everything from uh, cooking and, and uh, riding and working cows and running errands for parts and uh, then every now and then having to operate a tractor. <laughs> when you live 12 miles out from the nearest hard road, you kind of have a different aspect on life. You have to be able to do a little bit of everything. Uh, so it didn't matter whether you were male or female, black or white. 
you had a job to do. By the age of two, ranch children were riding in the saddle with their parents to work the cattle. By five, they had their own horse and a list of chores to do each day. I remember one day Thomas, about six years old, he said, Daddy, we never get to play baseball or anything like that. Uh, and maybe all the kids, we don't have a swimming pool like the kids in town have. Uh, and I didn't realize they missed those things. But life on the ranch had an intimacy with nature unknown to city folk. A ranch child's best friend might be a horse or baby pig. But I was the youngest of four children. The only playmates I had were my animals, and my brothers worked just like men. I raised everything from alligators, possums, hogs. I just uh, never played with dolls. Doing without was a constant theme in ranch life. Families often worked without outside hired help or the latest newfangled tractor. But that pioneering ability to make do could spell the difference between success or failure. <clears throat> Another thing is that as my dad always told me, it don't make any difference who you know or what you know, how smart you are or how dumb you are or anything. The only thing that counts in success is knowing what you can do without. Life in the saddle, herding ornery cattle was never easy. But in the 1920s, it became much tougher. The Texas tick arrived, infesting cattle and other livestock. A statewide eradication program required cattlemen to dip their cows in vats of arsenic every 14 days. Cowboying turned into an endless cycle of rounding up cattle for dipping. Fences sprang up to separate infested cows from the dipped animals. It was the beginning of the end of free-roaming cattle herds. In 1925, Martin County was formed, with Stewart as the county seat. But the new county quickly faced one of Florida's worst disasters. The very next year, two hurricanes wiped out the only large grove in Palm City Farms, plunging the area into economic turmoil. But that was just a taste of the destruction to come. In 1928, a hurricane with winds of 130 miles per hour barreled across southeast Florida. Powerful enough to break the Lake Okeechobee Dyke, the storm's winds and floods killed over 1,800 people. Most of the storm's victims were buried in a mass grave at Port Mayaka. Those who survived faced homes in ruin, crops underwater, and an increasingly bleak local and national economy. While Floridians struggled with the Depression, yet another Western pest left a lasting mark. In the 1930s, Dust Bowl cattle were shipped to Florida, bringing with them the screw worm. They had a devastating effect on the, the cattle and the wildlife, the hogs, the deer, and everything and they would literally eat the animals alive. Screwworms laid eggs in any open wound, making it necessary to constantly check the cattle for scratches. Cowmen used tar from pine trees to protect wounds and replaced whips and catch dogs with lassos until the infestation finally ended. But the cost of fencing and dipping cattle, together with the depression, put many small cattlemen out of business to encourage more tax income, the state let new owners buy ranch land for the cost of back taxes alone. Fencing, rather than free-ranging, became the sensible way to manage herds, which were being upgraded with better bloodlines. But putting fences in boggy marshlands was agonizingly slow work. Tractors were outfitted with wooden pads under metal tracks to keep them from sinking in the muck. When I got to my land uh, in Martin County, there wasn't even a fence around it. There were several ponds in there that was so boggy that even a man couldn't walk across. And we'd have to lay down and kind of crawl over and through the water there in the mud to get to the other side of it. The 1930s also proved to be a turning point for the Seminole Indians. The Indians believed they owned this land where their forefathers had hunted and lived. But when they were unable to produce a title or proof of ownership, the Indians were forced to relocate. The ranchers and growers who took their place 
also found their way of life changing. Ranches grew bigger in the 1940s. Major cattlemen like G.C. Troop, who created an ingenious gravity irrigation system, worked on a larger scale. The years of fence-free riding had vanished, along with a sense of adventure and kinship. I'd a lot rather live back in them days than I had today, e even under the hard circumstances. Like, I never had any electricity in the house or running water until I was 30 years old. And we didn't have any televisions and no radios or nothing like that. I missed the wildness of it, because it was really wild. And the cattle were wild. And a lot of your horses were <laughs> wild. You fed everybody that came by. If you had to feed them the last pork chop in the house, you fed them and you fed them with a smile because you wanted them to come back. You wanted them to feel at home and feel welcome. And it was really a lot of fun. It, the day is not fun like it was. Today the they got it down to a science and it was a lot better life back then. It was rougher and tougher, but it was more fun. The winds of change were sweeping through the citrus groves as well. Severe freezes in central and north Florida forced the citrus industry to move further and further south. By the 1950s, these growers had discovered Martin County. With its warm ocean breezes, this was the perfect citrus region, but only for those with enough money to tame the tough land. Western Martin County's topsoil had always been a three-foot layer of rock-hard dirt called hardpan. In the 1950s and 60s, specially created tillers and powerful bulldozers equipped for boggy spots were able to reach the fertile soil hidden below. But this technology was expensive and almost impossible for the small family grower to afford. It would not be practical, for instance, to, in most cases, to plant a 10-acre or a 20-acre 20, 20 grove. It had to be usually hundreds of acres. Huge groves owned by multinational corporations spread across western Martin County. One by one, the quaint old packing houses fell silent as time swept away their purpose. Today, only the Owens Grove packing house with its vintage equipment is still in operation. The fresh fruit packers were replaced with huge plants to process juice, frozen concentrate, and other byproducts which early settlers could not even imagine. But we also use the rind that's used in cattle feed. We also have other products uh, that are used in flavorings, perfumes, uh, uh, the, uh, hand cleaning uh, materials, uh, and uh, many other uh, products that come out. And this is uh, still an area that's expanding and growing. No longer were small family groves planted wherever the ground was high and dry. Today, perfect rows of citrus stretching for miles are shaped by machine. Martin County growers even helped create innovative new ways of watering and fertilizing, conquering the twin demons of drought and disease. 1974, I did pioneer the, uh, the beginning of the microjet system. A friend of mine brought the idea back from South Africa, and we were desperate for some type of system because with three springs in a row, we had run out of water in one of our other groves in another county. The high profitability of citrus in the 1980s, together with more freezes in central Florida, spurred record plantings in Martin County. But the oversupply has created new problems for growers. What's happening is that the supply is over the demand. So right now, orange juice is very reasonable for consumers. However, it makes it very difficult for the citrus growers to stay in business. It's almost a break even, and you really have to watch all your costs. Citrus growers still rely on the human touch to harvest and prepare their crops for market. This rugged land, which once broke the hearts and finances of countless small growers, now provides a living for thousands of citrus workers. The future, with its global market, holds both challenge and opportunity for Martin County's citrus. In these times of tightening competition and paper-thin profits, the reputation of Indian River citrus is worth its weight in gold. The foreign competition doesn't produce as much grapefruit, and they certainly doesn't produce 
as good a grapefruit as we can produce here in the river area and up and down the east coast, it's by far the best grapefruit in the world. And what of the cattle men and women whose love for ranch life often transcends its profitability? After decades of protecting cattle from wild panthers and alligators, ticks, screwworms, mosquitoes, droughts, and floods, today's cattlemen face a different challenge. Our problems today is mainly taxation, both the state and county ad valorem taxes and the federal income tax, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Today you have a lot of uh, government regulation and if you run out of water and want a water hole, you, you're faced with waiting a year for a permit or something like that. Uh, most of our problems today are paperwork. But as tough and heartbreaking as the cattle business has been for some, those who love working the herds would never trade their life for another. But when you go through hardships, and I don't think many people know what hardships are, and you get through, and you can look out and see beauty in nature, and you thank God how lucky you are. I never made no big money fooling with the cow business, but I've had some experiences that I wouldn't have never had if I'd have been involved in some other occupation, you know. And uh, after all, I think sometimes that what a man's happy at doing is half of his life anyhow. Today's cattle rancher often chooses the business out of love rather than money. Bob White has succeeded in a high-powered city job, but his ranch offers an escape from the turmoil of modern life. It's real important to me because you go to the coast, all you see is those concrete jungles, you know. Uh, I, I have no desire to be over there. Uh, this is my life. The cattle have given Bob and his family a refuge to rediscover the values of working alongside nature. As evening drifts across the meadows, Bob often pauses to watch the flourishing deer herds he's nurtured. For him, the ranch strengthens family bonds and creates lasting memories. We work together, in it, you know, as a family. And I just, I just be tickled to death when Justin gets a little bigger where he can go along and help. <laughs> I like to see the kids have a good time. I, I like to uh, share with them what, what I've got. In pioneer days, ranch families gave each newborn child their own calf. Cattle brands were like heirlooms to be passed from generation to generation. Today, parents try to hand down more than a ranch or a branding mark. They want to preserve a fierce love of land and family so that it may never fade from memory.